Hello and welcome to my channel Learning for Fun. In today's video, we will be learning about the philosophical assumptions of social group work. I know that I had been making videos on social casework, but then uh, it caught my attention that something on the other methods should also be talked about. So today we are going to learn about the philosophical assumptions of social group work. And before we do that, I would just like to reiterate on uh, what is philosophy. So philosophy is the love for wisdom. And when we say anything as philosophical assumptions, it's about um, those guidelines, those basic guidelines, which are going to help you as you work. So these assumptions, we hold them strongly while we practice a particular method. In this case, we are talking about the method of social group work in social work. So let's take a look at the philosophical assumptions of social group work. What do we really believe as we practice social group work? First thing that needs to be kept in mind is that these list of philosophical assumptions are, um, it's not an all inclusive list. It is a something which I have collected from different sources. And so it is not by one particular author. However, I have tried to keep it as comprehensive as possible. So uh, the first assumption is about man is a social animal. This we all know that uh, humans live in society and they do not really exist in isolation. While practicing social group work, this is an assumption that you need to keep in mind that man is a social animal. You cannot uh, simply isolate a person from the group to which they belong because they have been into it and ultimately they will be into some or the other group. So man is a social animal and definitely uh, is meeting the requirements and also meeting the requirements of others by being into this relationship as, a, as in a social animal. Next point suggests social interaction is a result of group life. The kind of interactions that we make in our day-to-day -day life the social interaction, that's, a, that's the result of a group life because our assumptions, the way we look at the world, it is all based on the kind of uh, social interactions that go on. It's all based on the socialization process at large. What is fed to us, with that information, we interact. With that information, we look at the world into which we live. With that information, we perceive the groups that are around us. With that information, we understand the events and situations that we are into. The different images that we have in our mind, the abstract as well as the concrete, this understanding is all based on our learnings. So social interaction is the result of group life. Ultimately, what we are listening from the other group members that affects our social interaction. The third point here is group experience is essential and an integral part of human existence. No human is uh, capable of uh, living alone. And when I'm saying this, I'm covering the entire lifespan of a person. So group experience is essential and an integral part of human existence, even with the people who are orphan, the people who are widow, widowers and so on, those who are really not having any family with them to support still, they do live in a group. Maybe they have a friend circle or maybe the neighborhood, maybe the relatives or somebody. Group experience is something which is essential for becoming human, for understanding the various uh, uh, details of human life, we, what we require is group experience. This teaches us a lot of things and a lot many experiments have been done uh, on this. A lot many situations have been discovered whereby certain children were raised by animals and uh, so it was very difficult for them to really relate to uh, the humans later. Group experience is something which is essential for human existence because it teaches us to be human. Next philosophical assumption says that group gives experiences which are 
monitored and selected in a beneficial way. These experiences and learnings are, if we individually as a person try to do, it will be limited to our own comprehensions and the explorations that we make. But if we are related to a group, their experiences, the ones that we select, the ones that we monitor, the ones that we feel are beneficial for us, it is giving us a chance to learn from the experiences of others. It also provides a sense of belongingness because when you are a part of the group, you do get a sense that there is somebody to be with me, somebody to stand with me, somebody to whom I can really share my experiences, my worries and problems. So that is what group brings in. Group also provides changes which are more paramount and can be obtained more quickly. This is because we are uh, doing a referencing with the group members. And when we have a stronger identity with the group, uh, these changes can be brought up very quickly. These changes become very uh, of utmost importance to us. They are paramount and can be obtained more quickly when we are in a group. So as an individual, uh, a person may hesitate. A person may think about it, may research about it. But when the group says a yes to it, it becomes easy to bring about changes. Next assumption says man's achievement can be increased and developed through group experiences. This again is to do with the referencing that we do in the group members. We want to be like them. They inculcate a sense of achievement in us as to what we don't have and what we have. There is always a comparison that human minds make. So man's achievement can be increased and developed to group experiences. The more you listen to what others have achieved, the more you will be driven to uh, strive for those achievements. Capacity to solve group problems can be solved by increased group experiences. So if you really want to work on the uh, problem solving capacities, as an individual, again, uh, the more you are thinking about, the more resources you have, the better will be the solution. But then the more people you have with you, rather than the material resources in terms of internet or books or so on, at least your learning is not going to be restricted to your own self. So this capacity certainly will increase upon uh, group members around you because with them, they are bringing their own background, they're bringing their own experiences, they're bringing their own knowledge and which will help you to reach up to a quality decision, which will help you to reach up to a great way of solving a problem, which otherwise as an individual becomes hard. Group experiences changes the level of aspiration of the group members, again, to do with social referencing, the group referencing that we make, our aspirations can be increased because you want to go higher and you look up uh, to the members with whom you are making a comparison. Group bring changes in the attitudes and behavior of people. This is again going on observation and uh, the bonding that the members are having with each other. So closer be the bond, higher will be the chances of uh, bringing in any attitudinal changes or changes in the behavior of the people because you connect to them. Group also helps in removal of difficulties created by exposure to previous learning. That's what I said. Your learning is not restricted to your own self when you are in a group. It goes beyond that and it goes to the experiences of other group members as well. So as you discuss with them, they are bringing in new insights to solve the problems because of their experiences and backgrounds. Groups are used as instruments which are economical in use in place of scarce resources. Groups can examine behavior and the general pattern of group behavior. So groups are used as instruments which are economical in use. Individually, when you have to solve a particular problem, you need to invest in any problem solving process. It is all limited to you. But then when it is about a group, you have shared resources with you. You can make use of them inclusive of the non-material resources. And this is what is making the process to be more economical. 
So rather than going for the scarce resources and investing in them, you know, struggling with this decision making uh, process, groups can be used up as instruments and they are economical because you have access to shared resources over there. Again, groups can examine behavior and the general pattern of group behavior. Uh, so with this, you can easily understand as to who can provide you with what resource and uh, whose behavior can really give you a boost because it's not just about the resources. Sometimes it's also about the behavior. It's also about the pattern. It's also about the attitude with which the members are approaching the problem. So that when there comes time where you are feeling low, the members can give you a push. This is possible when you are in a group. Group recreational activities are beneficial for both individual and society. Certainly, because as an individual, you are getting relaxed. And when you are getting relaxed, automatically your stress levels are going down. Automatically, your fatigue and the kind of tensions that you have experienced in your life will be removed or reduced at least to a certain extent, which in turn will be beneficial for the group as well as to the society at large. Here, the structure of society, if you are trying to understand, you need to remember that individuals, when they are coming together, they will make groups. Groups, when they are coming together, they will make communities. Communities, when they are coming together, they make society. So any kind of changes that we are expecting in the group is definitely bringing a change in the individual and at large that goes to the society. Group work focuses its attention on two types of activities that is program and social relationship. So when we talk about social group work, remember that it is a method of social work, which means it is intended towards problem solving. It's not merely people coming in together and doing some work and getting the output of it like a team or something. But when we talk about social group work, it is focused on some problem. That is the primary need. That's a primary purpose of social work itself. So any method that we are studying under social work is definitely going to be inclined towards this problem solving. As such, there are two types of activities which we focus on. One is program. Uh, now this is focused more on the problem solving aspects. So what is the problem that the group has picked up and is working on. Say, for example, if it is a, if it is a study group, then what is the subject and then what they are doing about it? Or if it is a, if it is a group of patients, then what is the core problem in it? The common problem towards which we are aiming and trying to work on. So your program is on that. However, uh, it's not just about conduction of certain activities or increasing the group experiences and learnings, but then there comes an aspect of group dynamics also, which is focused on the social relationships. So how are members really interacting with each other and promoting each other, motivating each other, the connect, which is there, not just the goal of this activity, but also the happenings that go on. Professional knowledge and skills are essential for working with the group. So you need an understanding of the dynamics of the group. You need an understanding of uh, the professional knowledge regarding the problem that you are uh, dealing with. It just can't be that you are uh, uh, a beginner and you don't have any knowledge about the problem and you are applying this method of social group work without discovering what the problem is. So a knowledge of that along with the knowledge of behavior is important while you are practicing social group work. So certain disciplines like sociology, psychology, definitely they are prominent. They play a role while uh, exercising this method of social group work because we are dealing with humans. You need to know about their behavior. You need to know about the way uh, their behaviors are molded by the society into which they live. So while understanding a group, while working with the group, understanding of the larger society, the culture aspects, and a lot many things that uh, sociology brings in, a lot many things that psychology also brings in as, uh, as in uh, certain concepts, like uh, especially in group dynamics, which should be understood, human behavior, which should be understood, 
while working with uh, a group. And there are certain concepts from other disciplines also which should be known. Uh, some of them come from disciplines like political science. They may be coming from law where you need to work within a legal framework. They may be coming from economics which help you to understand the financial condition of the members present in a group. Uh, things like when you're working with uh, uh, self-help groups and where your primary objective is uh, savings, inculcating this habit of small savings and then all these other disciplines also can play a role while exercising group work as a method in social work. So that's all for uh, the philosophical assumptions in social group work. I hope that uh, you understood something from this, uh, from this video and uh, now it would be easier for you to practice social group work. Remember that philosophical assumptions are those assumptions that you really have to keep in mind while practicing social group work. So this wisdom, when you apply to your practice, will 100% be resulting in better results. Right. So with that, I would be taking your leave. Uh, until we meet next, take care. Keep learning, keep growing. If you like this video, hit a like button. If you want to see such videos further, do subscribe to my channel. And if you have any suggestions or comments, feel free to write. You can even write to me personally on the email ID, which is provided below. Thank you for watching this video. Thanks a lot.